Well, welcome. My name is Eldine Posniak, and I'm going to talk to you today about multicultural considerations within communication and our training. It's important to have those kinds of considerations with the jobs that we do as safety professionals, as trainers, to ensure that we're effective and efficient with our communication. So we have great opportunity with what we do to work with people around the world absolutely amazing opportunities that are there. And to be able to communicate with them effectively so that we can give them the information, the skills and the knowledge that they need to do their jobs and to do them well and to do them safe, we need to have certain considerations in place because different people from different parts of the world communicate differently. It doesn't matter where you're from or where you're going to, there's certain things that we can look at to make sure that we are more effective and efficient in our communication. So I'm going to share some of those things, some of the things that I deal with or that I look at from that professional standpoint. I'm from Canada, so we look at things a little bit differently than we might look at if we were from India or from Argentina, from Japan, from the Middle East, and even from the UK. When I look at health and safety, or even when I look at communication, I look at it from that hazard, risk, and control standpoint. That's basically what we operate. That's our, the basics of what we do for a living as safety professionals, as the communication to safety professionals that we're training. So in communication, it's no different. If I say something or do something that offends one of the people in my audience, I lose credibility. They may not listen to me. They may not take the information back. If I do not communicate in a style that they prefer to learn in, they may not get the information that's necessary to take back to utilize. So there's our hazard and our risk. The right control is to have some cultural intelligence. And that's the basis of my communication with you all today, is the cultural intelligence. So with this slide here, this is the basis that I often work within, is that if we have a knowledge about a culture, that the cultural traits that are there, then we can adapt our communication style to their learning abilities. Now, I'm not talking about profiling another culture from another country, but I'm talking about generalization, because we do know that people often will think or believe or approach things differently based on the country that they come from. If we combine that with self-knowledge, what is the country that I come from? How do I react? How do I communicate? How do I prefer to receive information? Uh, and to give information, I can adapt my style to a cultural trait that's there. And then if there's certain little key elements or skills that I have that can increase the effect of communication, then I need to do that as well. So if I combine those three things, I have a good cultural intelligence or awareness. So I'm going to spend the next few minutes just sharing how I approach that. All right. There are five culture scales that I look at and I start to judge when I'm either developing curriculum, I'm going to go to an area and talk to people, either individually or a group, or I'm going to take a set education package and present it. And those five culture scales are equality versus hierarchy, direct versus indirect communication, individual versus group communication styles, task versus relationship cultural attitudes, and risk versus caution in approaches. If I look at each one of these, and which we will do and we'll go through, and I'll give some examples, I can then set my communication style to meet with the people that, that I'm meeting with. So the first one is equality versus hierarchy. People, and look at these scales as if you want visually on a 1 to a 10. That equality, there's a bipolar equality <laughs> to, a, to a, a polar uh, hierarchy. There's extremes at each end. Um, and that sometimes cultures can go along that scale that's there. But we'll kind of look at each one in the, the, the polar uh, polar aspects. Equality, if a culture believes more in equality or they're based within that, they believe that everyone's basically the... Uh, the same in, in approach. They're open to discussion amongst different levels and organizations, and you often see organizations more flatlined within it. These cultures often uh, embrace teamwork um, and like to have joint open discussions, and they'll often uh, collaborate in decision making. 
If we look at the other opposite end in hierarchy, these are more the pyramidal structures of organizations where it's who you are in the organization to how you communicate and make decisions. So there's more of that top-down kind of approach. And you'll often see in that cultural focus that genders or the level of a caste system within an organization or in a culture will reflect specific roles that are expected of you. So if I am from a equality culture and I'm working in a hierarchy culture, uh, I'm going to be talking to them. I need to understand how that operates because that reflects on how I communicate to make sure that it's effective and efficient communication. Hierarchies have a great influence on the communication style and how I'm going to talk to people within the room. One of the examples that I often look at is, is if I know that it's a higher hierarchical group that I'm speaking to, that there's certain people that may only speak to me if I ask a question um, or I try to engage the group because of who they are in the organization. And no one else will speak. So do I go back and say, I did not engage my group today. There just wasn't good engagement. No one was paying attention. I've lost them. Or is it because an individual was sitting in the room and no one felt comfortable enough to speak because of who they were? So it may not be the style that I was looking for. I wanted active engagement. But if I realize in that hierarchy, I may not get that. So I may not even want to plan a group activity. So I might be asking questions. If I fail to acknowledge the status of an individual that's in my room in a hierarchical organization and treat them the same as everyone else, I may actually lose credibility within that group and they may not pay attention to what I'm saying. Not only of the individual that I may have offend, possibly offended by not paying attention to, but the other group realizes that I haven't done what I was supposed to do and therefore I wasn't being respectful and they turn off. So this is just an example of using that kind of concept that's there. The level of formality that I utilize with that group is also based upon this criteria that I look at. So if I'm looking at a more hierarchical group, I will often be more formal. It's Mr. So-and-so, it's Mrs. So-and-so, Dr. So-and-so. Uh, if I'm looking for more of an equality-based culture, then we become a little more informal. We may often use our first names. Well, I'm Eldine, and this is Joe, and this is Pete. And that would be acceptable. We would also take a look at, at sort of power issues in what we call communication power styles. Is that one individual, again, may communicate for the whole group in a hierarchical aspect, where in an equality aspect, I may have people talking over each other, and that would be totally acceptable within that format. <clears throat> we also take a look at how we want to portray our safety information or the, any other information that we're going forward when we ask people to take action when they go back into the workplace and even within a safety management system activities themselves. We will find, as you'll see on this slide, the consensus collaborative and command approach that the equality base sits more often in the consensus side of things where the hierarchical is more in a command. So if I'm asking people to do activities within their workplace or even within my training or workshop that is consensus based but they are in a hierarchical culture, they're not going to go over as well <laughs> as if I put it in a command and control structure. So the example that I've used here is in, in Canada, employees are granted sort of the, the freedom and the, and the power to take initiative if they want to in a, in a safety management system or an interaction in the workplace to make a change that's there. Um, and so I can put that within my education and within my system. But if I try to impose that in a hierarchical culture, say as in Japan, that's not going to work as well because people feel that they cannot come forward. That's the manager's role and job because of their state of responsibility and expected control. The second scale that I look at is communication style. Is it direct communication style or indirect communication style? With a direct communication style, that's more, I, I mean what I say, I say what I mean. Eh, there's not a lot left to imagination and I don't have to try to decide what that person is saying or not. Uh, it's, it's fairly straightforward. Direct communication style cultures are not scared to engage in conflict. 
I will tell you what my opinion is, but I expect that you share your opinion with me as well. And it's okay to have a little bit of uh, constructive criticism as we go forward. But in an indirect style culture of communication, it's all about respect and saving face and not offending anyone and keeping a, a, a control over the communication. In these cultures, you'll often have people who won't even say no but how they say yes and how it's said, it's more about how things are said, you have to read that, yeah, that's probably not gonna happen, <laughs> even though I said yes. Uh, so it, th they express their concerns tactfully and they avoid conflict at all possible. So this comes back to how am I going to do a, a role play, a, a game within my training or education sessions? Because if I'm a direct communicator, uh, I may, fully participate within a, a role play or a, a, a discussion, how do I handle a difficult situation? But if I'm an indirect communicator, then I'm going to shy away from those. I won't be as engaged into the activities that are there. So that's where I use this culture. I um, want to, to take a look at that. Um, so this is just an example of different cultures and in, uh, the different role play aspects within direct and indirect communication. So in the first picture in India, they like to have uh, open conversations, they'll exchange opinions quite readily, and you can facilitate that, and often you have to even end up controlling it because it can go down a path or go longer than you may want it to actually uh, go in. Uh, the second picture in the Philippines, They'll actively participate if it's actively encouraged and that there's a lot of positive feedback for participating. So you have to kind of draw it out and when you draw it out then it will um, work quite well. Where in Japan, if they're not prepared with the questions beforehand and expected to contribute in the education session, if you just bring it forward within that, then they'll act, uh, often just sit quietly because they have more of an indirect communication style. So know your target audience. The individual or group is another cultural uh, aspect that I take a look at because some cultures believe very much in individual identity, individual contribution and communication styles, that people can make decisions as an individual, and that if I play a role in a team, I can move between teams and groups quite seamlessly to make sure that a task is done at the end of the day. Some cultures more focus on a group aspect, which is it's all about the group and who I am within the group. And often when I'm in a group, I don't move between groups and I often stay in that group for my life. <laughs> and so they often work more from standardized guidelines and expectations of roles and responsibilities within that, that grouping that they are uh, placed within uh, and conform to the, the norms within it. So if I'm looking at individuals or group cultures, how I again engage them is going to be very, very important. So let's use an example of Italy. Uh, in Italy, there the individual aspect um, does come through, but if I know that they, they cherish education, uh, teachers, uh, people who communicate very well, presenters, that they're admired and adhered to, then I, I can talk to them on a different level. Right? I use example of things that are important to the participants, and then I have their attention both as a group culture and as individuals, their life and their home life is very important to them. So if I can get on a relationship level with them as an individual, I'll have more credibility. If I get to a relationship level and as, an as, as a, a culture, right? so if I know their current events, the sporting, uh, which car race is there, who's playing soccer, uh, what team is winning, um, I have some instant credibility because I've established a rapport with an individual on a basis. Also knowing then as a collective group and as, as individuals, time is a little bit different um, to Italians than maybe a Canadian, uh, that we may not expect to start early, but the expectation to leave early is definitely there. Right. Uh, task versus relationship culture consideration. Some groupings and culture groupings are task focused versus 
relationship focused. So task focused means it's all about work. We'll stay late, we come early, we stay late, we'll do a little bit more, and at times our family and our personal life will even get hampered, and that's acceptable in our society. Um, and, and so I can sometimes look to in uh, the UK, Germany, uh, some of those European companies, Canada, the United States, where that's very acceptable uh, in, in how we approach life. Uh, we will get to know coworkers, but we have a social network and we have a work network and we kind of keep the two in between. If we're relationship-based, uh, and again, this can differ in countries because Canada, sometimes we have groups that are task-orientated and groups that are relationship oriented so it can differ sometimes even within a country. But relationship oriented is about the people. When relationship culture is higher, they often hire because it's of who we know or someone's related to someone versus they're really good on a resume and it's very objective in the task focus. Relationship people will often um, focus again on what we do in our leisure time, our, our family. Uh, when you do business or communicate with these people, it's about establishing the rapport before we get down to business or the task. So again, knowing where the culture is at can tell us how to approach the training as well as communicate with the people in the training sessions. So in Argentina, they're relationship-based. So they like to learn about you, you learn about them, and then we get down to task. I'll often start my education session with a little bit about who I am. Right? That, I, that I'm a, a mother and a grandmother and uh, start to build a rapport and these are the sports that I like and this is what I like about your country and uh, to establish that relationship. Find those connections. And their learning style is more about telling a story. They want to learn from an antidote, a story uh, uh, that, that's there. If I compare that with an education session that I may do in Germany, they're much more task focused. Please stop telling us stories and let's get down to the pertinent facts. Uh, so it, it's all about uh, time for them. Arrive early, stay late. Uh, let's make sure that we have this, we have it well so that we can go forward. Uh, their preferred learning style then is lecture versus the, the storytelling and the, the back and forth. Right. So again, that you can see where now even a couple of them are overlapping, indirect and direct, task and relationship. Risk and caution is the, the next one that I take a look at when I am designing or planning to deliver education or communication. If people are more risk-based, this means that I'm willing to take a few more chances. I, I, quick, I can change quickly without a risk of, of being fearful of making a mistake or something going wrong. Uh, often have fewer rules or guidelines within this type of culture and I'm comfortable with changing uh, plans. If I am more on a caution-based culture, then I don't want to lose face if I make a mistake. And so therefore, I'm not going to make a mistake and I'm not going to speak up. So we're often more cautious. We'll make sure that we're focused and focused and focused and we aim and we aim and we aim before we fire um, with, our, with our approach. We'll often learn much more from the, the past or focus on the past and how that influences the decisions that we're making today. So when I communicate with these groups to justify the why we're doing something, if I'm talking with a caution-based culture, I may build upon what we've done in the past how this has worked or not worked to build up to what I'm asking them to do today. With the more risk group, I mean spend less time doing that because it's all about now and it's all about what we're going to be doing next and we can change if this doesn't work. So how I focus my communication. <clears throat> An example of a more cautious group can maybe one from uh, Japan where they're not as willing to change or to speak up. Uh, employees in Japan typically don't move between organization and organization. They often stay with an organization for a long period of time. The only way you move up in the organization is, is, is if you're successful. And if you're successful, it usually means that you've heard a lot of silence, because silence is approval. If people give you a lot of feedback in some of the Asia-Pacific uh, cultures, that means you're not doing as well as you should. So if I'm silent to you in class, or I don't give you a lot of feedback, good job, good job, 
you think you're doing a great job. But if I'm a Canadian sitting in that class and you don't pat me on the back every five minutes, I think that I'm, I'm am I doing okay? Am I doing okay? Please tell me I'm doing okay. So this is again where we take a look at risk and caution, direct, indirect communication, how it affects how we communicate with these groups of people. So it does, again, communicate, feedback, affects the levels that we do. More direct or indirect communication styles uh, is a huge consideration, and the amount of feedback and praise that we give in class uh, is dependent upon and the risk and the caution and the aspects that are there. So I try to put it all together. I try to use each one of those classifications into uh, looking at and planning the course that's there. Do you tend to find when you're doing training that um, companies adapt to the culture of the country they are operating in or whether they expect their employees to adapt to the company culture? Hmm. That's a great question. Uh, if you are an expat going into another country, uh, there's an expectation that when you go into their country that you will have better adaptation and, and knowledge within it. If it's a multinational company and they're spreading their wings and going to other countries, that's where it sometimes differs. I see um, two approaches. Uh, an example was a Japanese com company coming into North America. They still had a certain type of hierarchical style that they wanted to keep, but we saw it softening once it was sort of on the North American soil. But when the Japanese came over and senior leadership came over to visit, then it strengthened up again, right? So there's a knowledge that you need to impart if you're one of those organizations to what's the internal culture you want in your organization and the communication lines that you want to follow within that. Okay. Oh, thank you, that's really interesting. All right, thanks. Um, <clears throat> so again, just kind of bringing it together is knowing the countries that you may be working in, and it kind of comes back to your question, is if I'm going to that country or I'm going to have some of those country population come over and work for me in a different area, how do I communicate with them to be the most effective and efficient? So an example is um, if I have a large India population, uh, whether here or abroad, that I'm speaking to, I know that they like things more black and white. They don't have a lot of fuzzy gray. It's either right or wrong. There's you know one of two ways to approach it. So I will keep my communication much more into that there's a couple choices. There's not a plethora. It's just uh, one or two things that are there. Um, their audience likes to talk and participate, so I'll often throw things out for debate. What do you think could be the choice to uh, for approach? Right? I also am very knowledgeable that within this culture that sometimes the gender roles, there's certain expectations and levels of comfort within that. So women may not mix comfortably with men and especially with men from other cultures. And so you have to allow for some gender differences if you're going to put people into groups or ask for uh, communication or class participation. If we compare that with a group, say, from Indonesia, um, they prefer not to do such individual activities, but more group activities, because there is that certain amount of saving face, is you don't want to personally embarrass someone. They find much more comfort to participate if it's a larger group and they all can bear um, the positive or, or the possible uh, negativity that can come from that. So team competitions versus individual work is where you would want to go with them. Uh, again, complimenting and praising them early on and for the things that they do do well and that they know that you're not going to focus on negative aspects will encourage participation and group discussion as we go along. This is one of those groups that will say yes even though they mean no. And so you have to be very wary of how they say yes in the intonation and the way that they do that. So if you say, how are we going? Does everyone understand? Yes and they may not have that. So if there's a lot of the blank looks and people are still looking through their papers, then you may want to go back and reiterate what you've just talked about. Um, you want to design feedback to be gathered in small groups as well for anonymity because you don't want to single out individuals. It's more of, well, your group has and this is the contribution. 
Another example, a little bit different, um, is Philippines. Important to begin with objectives so they can know what's being expected of them throughout the day. They want to know prior to, where again, some other groups, they're good to just kind of go along with how the day's going to unfold. Uh, they are open to personal stories, so they don't mind you sharing the antidotes and the stories. Uh, credibility comes with dressing for impressing. So how you dress can give how you're perceived to how well they listen to what you have to say. When you look at your stories, when you're dressed to impress up there and you're telling your stories, they do like humor. Um, and more than some of the other Asia Pacific cultures, they do like a sense of humor. And if you laugh at your own joke, they will laugh with you. Whether they find it funny or not, they will laugh with you. Um, can they like to have that relationship connection so talking about the latest movie or the sports game or what's going on in their community can, and tying the story to that to the point that you want to make will be very effective. So now that I've looked at some of those cultural, um, cultural information as I'm planning and developing, there's also a few things that I go on a checklist to say, am I doing right? Do I have knowledge about it for the culture that I'm going to be with, within? Um, and that's setting strong first impressions, again, direct and indirect communication styles to how I'm going to talk, uh, physical distance and eye contact, the different gestures, physical gestures and posturing that I utilize, and the level of formality, nonverbal communication that I utilize. And so I'll just uh, go through a few of those now. First, strong impressions. There's some great resources out there for self-learning, and this is one that I really appreciate, is Multicultural Manners by uh, Dresser, that talks a lot about how we can kind of do that first impression, but what are the mannerisms and the manners that are expected within different cultural norms. One of the things that it says in that book is, learn how to say hello in the language. And even if you make a mess of it, they will respect you for trying. So there's a few, few words, yes, thank you, please, um, that, that are important. Learn how to show signs of respect. So here's an example of a, a Westerner greeting someone from the Asia area. And do you bow or do you shake hands? In today's day and age of more global harmonization and global awareness, the day of TV and internet, we see the softenings of some cultures, the more awareness of cross-culture, cross-culture communication. So you may go to that culture and go to bow, and when they stick out their hand because they're aware of your culture and want to shake your hand, what do you do? I always go to the other culture first. So if I'm bowing and they shake, come to shake my hand, I'll smile and nod, and then I will shake their hand, and then I'll go back to bow. So that I have reciprocated to what they're coming to me with, and I go back to respecting their culture. But then, how do you bow? How far do you bow? How do you, right? So you should always look at what the other person is doing, and at least meet that, and go just a little bit lower. Because the one who has a higher status in a hierarchical environment or culture should always be a little bit higher. So you can give the other person their other a little more respect by going just a little bit lower. They'll appreciate that. If they appreciate you, they see that you're going the extra mile, they'll always listen to you just a little bit more. How you handle a business card is very important in some countries. In North America, we just see it as a transaction of business. This is a convenience. Thank you very much. I know how to get a hold of you. This is wonderful. It often gets put in a pocket, a card holder. Uh, or it gets dropped in our purse or even a bowl <laughs> at times. Right? In other countries, this is a more important transaction, and it tells you what that person means to you. So again, if we're looking at sort of an Asia Pacific or a good rule of thumb, is handing a business card with either your fingers in the right corner or both hands with the writing directed at the other person directly. When you take that card or when they take that card, again, it's both hands looking at it, saying the name, the position, 
handling the card with respect. And if you're that trainer that day, the best thing that I can advise you to do is you take those cards, once you've, thank you very much, you acknowledge who they are, you treat it with respect, and I'll often set it on my front table in the position that people are sitting. So I always have it for reference, which helps with the names if I'm calling out <laughs> to the individual, but it also shows them a sign of respect for the people that are there. Start off with the, the fir best first impression that you possibly can. And that's going to be dependent upon your culture, how you introduce yourself, how do you say who you are. So in China, <clears throat> I'll be more humble. I will constantly thank them for the opportunity to be there. And this is such an honor that I can learn from them as well as them learning from, from me. Um, so even after I may share who I am and what my credentials are, again, there's many thank yous within that because being a humble person is highly respected and regarded. Where in India, because advanced education is highly regarded, they're going to want to know all of my degrees, what university, what experience I've had, and that's what I'll be focused on. So I might sound a little more like I'm bragging there, but then that's what's more acceptable and expected because they want to know because of the respect for education. In Argentina, it's the firm handshake and then how do we connect? What's the relationship basis? Do we both work here? Do we both have grandchildren? We both like NASCAR racing. <laughs> so finding a relationship connection is important to them. So again, culture base, making a good first impression. Good first impression is being knowledgeable about their time cultural influences. So again, in, in Germany, I'm going to be punctual, I'm going to be on time, I'm going to be willing to stay late and be prepared for that. If I am in South America, time again is a general guideline. I'm not going to be upset if some of them wander in a little bit late, leave part way through, come back. Uh, it's just a part of the culture that's there. So if I know that and I accept it, time is also important within different cultures based upon how much time is relationship building. If I'm doing work in the Middle East and I'm going to have a meeting or a communication uh, training session, the first part might be all about building our relationship and we'll get to the training when we get to the training. Because if we haven't established that relationship first, the training doesn't matter. So we spend our time within that, then we move into into the, the content or the, the task oriented aspects of our communication. Just going to refer again to the direct and indirect because this is a really un key underpinning to how we communicate and expect others to communicate back to us. So if I go back to that original slide, if people are more direct communicators, I might have more role playing, more sharing of opinion, more sharing of stories. Where if they're indirect communicators, it may be more um, lecture style, set, prepared uh, participation. Knowing my physical distance, how close I can be to someone when I'm teaching or talking to them versus how far away is very important because if I'm too close and I make them uncomfortable um, or I'm too far away and make them uncomfortable, then they're not going to listen to me as well as uh, another aspect. How much space we take up with gestures in our body is, a, is another con, uh, consideration and to touch or not to touch. Do I shake your hand or don't I shake your hand? North America and in uh, Europe, it's very common for um, to shake a hand when we meet people. When I go to the Middle East, being a, from the female gender, I don't stick my hand out first. I'll see if someone will do that. With other females, I may shake, I'll shake their hand, but with other males, that's not acceptable within the culture. So I let them take the initiative to whether I do or whether I don't. Eye contact. Get coming from North America, I expect people to look at me when I talk to them. Otherwise, I think they're ignoring me or not paying attention or thinking about getting milk from the store after the education session. <laughs> and so uh, I need to be very aware that in certain countries, in Indonesia and so forth, that direct eye contact is considered rude, especially with people that you respect. You reserve that more for family members and, and social relationships. And so if, if you're talking to them and they look away, that's not a sign of them being embarrassed or disrespectful or not listening. They are actually being respectful. So you wouldn't want to demand that they look at you and look at me when I'm talking to you um, because then you've offended them. They're going to pull back. They're not going to learn as much. 
<clears throat> know your intonation, your, your volume, your pace, uh, and ensure that it's specific to the, the group that you're speaking with. Some groups speak a little bit faster and quicker, but if English is a second language and I'm teaching in English, I probably want to slow it down. Um, what's our nonverbal communications? What are we communicating through our gestures, our postures, use of silence, or, or even nodding? We have to be aware of what's happening from country to country. Uh, the universal sign of OK is not the universal sign of OK. <laughs> and so we have to be careful with our gestures. And the one story that I often talk about is a, a group of Italians uh, that I was working with, a uh, very traditional Italian uh, male group. I had a interpreter, and I wanted to make sure that I was getting the correct message across. And at the end of the day, I said, so uh, do you understand? Is everything OK? Is everything OK? And I offended them all. They, they took a deep breath in and they looked at me and I thought, oh no, I, I could tell I did something wrong. And the interpreter said, you just called them a bad name. Because in some countries, this is more of a, a it's derogatory symbol or a sexual gesture. And so if they're from Turkey or Italy or Lebanon, they're going to be insulted. It's the same with the thumbs up, which is acceptable in certain parts of the world and which, again, is a sexual gesture in other parts of the world. So know what physical gestures mean before you do them. Just you don't have to learn by, <laughs> by, your own, by your own mistakes. Come here gestures is another one uh, that you might want to look at adapting to being more uh, universal that's there. Having more of a hand down come here or a hand up come here gesture is often seen as more politically correct than often a, uh, the, the one hand or finger gesture to uh, come hither, which can again be misconstrued for an offensive gesture. Sitting cross-legged, common in North America and some European countries, but highly offensive um, within the Middle East or in Asia because show, so showing the soles of your feet um, is, a, is an insult. And so knowing these kinds of aspects. Uh, I talk a lot with my hands. My natural personality comes out very big sometimes. And so I know for North America or big audiences when I'm on a stage, it may be very appropriate to have a big presence. But if I'm speaking again with uh, some Asia Pacific or German, uh, Norwegian, uh, Denmark populations, they see that as very distracting and annoying um, and even offensive. Um, and so I'll try to calm my gestures down. And, and again, for me, my natural pace is very big. So I have to learn to do so the tricks of having a hand in a pocket, making sure that you feel the touch. So cultural trait, knowledge, self-awareness, <laughs> and looking at some of the specific aspects. Knowing the body language around the world, the yes, no nod. <laughs> uh, so for a lot of countries, this is yes and this is no. But if I'm asking, do you understand in uh, Bulgaria or with Greeks, and they do this when I say, do you understand, that means no. So I have to be very conscious of that with that group so that I can switch instead of going, oh great, you all understand, and moving on, they went, yes, yeah, you just lost us. Uh, conversation flow, understand that in, if I have an open, direct communication style based upon relationships and equality, having a lively discussion where we over talk each other from time to time or interrupt may be totally acceptable. But if it's more of a direct, hierarchical style, there's an expected silence after each person is done talking to go on to the next person or the next idea. And speaking of language, <laughs> if I'm teaching a course in a foreign country where English is a second language, I have to think about, do I speak? Do I have an interpreter? Which is going to be the best way to convey, convey the information? Uh, sometimes we even look at having more pictographs or symbols so that people can interpret it through that. And, and in safety, that's not uncommon. This is a great example of having pictographs and colors mean certain things. Well, we need to be aware of that colors can mean different things in different countries and, so, uh, and can be offensive depending on. If we're in Mexico, they have a NOM or a regulation in health and safety that's very specific to colors of specific hazards that are there that are not always the same around the world. 
We also know that um, you know white in in Hong Kong is associated with funerals, and and the French don't like always yellow, and Spaniards don't like yellow because they have negative connotations to it that are historical, that are kind of cultural. So I wouldn't want to put my slides up in yellow because they may just have a cultural instinctual dislike for it, therefore cannot absorb the information as, a, as appropriately. Uh, again, learning from some of my mistakes, as uh, we had a, a wonderful North America organization that had bought a, a Chinese uh, a factory, and we had a great initiative in North America, which was uh, the Wise Owl Hat, a safety initiative. So if people went above and beyond what they did, we gave them a green hat that had an owl on it, and it was a sign of respect and recognition and, and a thank you for what you've done. And they gave a box of these to me and said, Eldine, when you go over to the, the, the factory in China, could you please hand out these green owl hats to all the senior leadership? And I thought, what a great idea. A token, a appreciation. Not much different than what we might reward in a training education session. And when I handed out these green hats to all the senior leadership, again, they looked at them and it was, um, and looked at me and, and turned to, again, my guide and interpreter and said, did I do something wrong? And he says, yes, you did. He said, often if someone is presented with a green hat, it's telling them that their wife is uh, having an affair. And so <laughs> you, you may not be communicating a good thing through a color and, and a symbol that I wasn't aware of. So if we're bringing trinkets to give out to a reward, a group participation, make sure it's culturally sensitive that's there. Another example was uh, within that, and it's not just China, it can be in other countries as well. Uh, St. Patrick's Day, uh, a social evening at a, at a house by two Canadian expats invited people over and gave them green hats and green necklaces and green and they were upset then their local uh, peers that when they went back into the workplace the next day it had turned the relationship somewhat and so what we do even in social aspects before or after class can affect how people treat us or learn after, uh, during class. So colors mean different things. So that should reflect in our safety signs, knowing the symbols um, are there. So pictographs, again, are really good when we communicate. Uh, make sure that the pictures show what we want them to do, but we might also want to show them things that we don't want them to do, um, and, and make sure it's very clear this is not what's acceptable and this is what is acceptable. But again, visual, people can often interpret that a lot more than, than a written word. And that then can reflect into our training programs where we refer, and here's just an example um, from Australia, where we can put practices and, and such into videos and to templates that people can then watch and they understand what we actually want versus a written word or a misinterpretation of a language. Know our cultural bound references. In North America, especially Canada, we're very proud of our hockey. And so when I talk about teamwork in Canada, I'll often talk about the hockey team. And maybe here in, in the UK or in uh, uh, certain countries, but definitely in the United States, they'll often talk about baseball. I have a tendency now to use soccer or football, depending on which country you're in, because that's more of a universal known sport and people can relate to it much more than if I talk about hockey, if I'm talking about teamwork. So know the sports or the, the, the antidotes that they utilize and make sure that, the, that they are familiar. If you are using an interpreter, uh, ensure that you uh, speak a little slower. Often if we're um, speaking to people in different languages, we usually get louder, not so much slower. So it's important to focus on the, the slow speech, articulate clearly, not use a lot of big words, give time for the interpreter to catch up, and give them some breaks, because often English is their second language, and so they have to interpret it twice. And it's very exhausting for them. An essential guide to training global audiences uh, by McClay and Irwin, talks a lot about those kinds of aspects and how you can change to train to those, those multicultural international audiences. If you're going to ask a question to an international audience, give them more time to answer. Because if English is a second language, they have to think about it to get it into English. 
Um, they often will then also judge what other people are thinking, how they're participating, and go along those uh, lines. If you can provide questions beforehand, especially for people who have indirect communication and hierarchical cultures, they're more likely to participate than not. So where do I learn some of these things about different cultures so I know how to shake their hand, hand a business card, what gesture is offensive, what gift should I bring? Should I bring a gift? Uh, there's again a lot of good resources out there, but one of the best ones is Kiss, Bow, or Shake Hands by uh, Morrison Conway. It outlines uh, pretty well by country um, what you can, uh, can and cannot do um, as you go forward. Inclusiveness. Try to eliminate the, well, back home we do this kind of statements, because that can be seen as uh, condescending and controversial at times. Um, I'm here to tell you how it's best to be done kind of aspect, where you can make reference to a home country so that people understand that there's some difference and have some empathy to maybe why your approach is a little different. Uh, and that would be the best to, to focus on. Best advice, stay away from any religious or political uh, antidotes, stories, or jokes, because those are often more highly offensive to groups than any, uh, anything else. Right? So cultural differences aside, a couple other little key things would be, again, dress appropriately. Know what's appropriate dress for that, that country. Is it more casual? Is it more covered? Is it uh, a certain style that you need to wear to have that credibility and the respect? When you fly abroad for business purposes, be aware of jet lag. You don't want to just fly in and do the training session because then, again, you may not be the best on your game. You want to come in at least the day before. And, and, and then that gives you time to look at the newspaper, watch TV, know what's going on to be able to connect where you are to who you are. A lot of self-learning opportunities. I've just touched today on a couple of the main topics that I consider when I do this kind of education. Uh, and here's some resources that I'm giving you that I think that if you want to do some self-learning opportunities, these are good reads, uh, good audio books. There's a lot of YouTube videos on these topics by these authors. Um, would be good to take a look at. To end, the best advice that I can give you is be culturally intelligent. Be aware of the traits of the culture that you're speaking to. Right? Um, be accepting of them and non-judgmental, because you may come from a different cultural trait or background. And understand and work with them and have fun with what you do. Is there any other questions before I say thank you? Um, training people globally, I would just be interested in what barriers you've come across as a woman. Hmm. <clears throat> uh, again, looking at cultures, especially within the equality hierarchy uh, base that's there and direct or in indirect, uh, there has been some challenges. They come most with how I dress, uh, my approach, my gestures, and my body space. So if I've been non-confrontational, non-judgmental and accepting, I haven't had much of a problem. It's when I feel that my, my cultural traits um, are being infringed upon that, I, that sometimes I, I will get bothered by it. But I've learned to, to be accepting. So learning, and it's been, I think, maybe even more important for the female gender to learn some of these things than sometimes the male gender, is exactly that. How much eye contact is appropriate? What messages does it send to touch or not to touch? How to dress? Uh, how to set uh, the appropriate tone dependent on that culture so that I do have immediate credibility. But I've spoken and taught in 21 different countries around the world, different uh, culture classes and structures, men, female, uh, uh, senior leadership to frontline workers and been able to adapt. Some choices I have made though is to acknowledge that in this certain culture, at this certain level of an organization, it's not appropriate for me to do the training. It's going to be appropriate for my peer, Peter, to do the training because there's going to be more credibility and so forth. And you know what? For me, in health and safety, that's okay because the important trait is 
that we get the right message across, that people have the skills and the knowledge that's necessary, and we need to go forward. So we work with what we need to, to, to do that. Thank Thanks. Yeah. The one um, last thing I guess I want to talk about that builds upon that is sometimes we don't have a set culture in a room. We might have multi-cultures in a room. So it's not just Japanese and German or Argentinians or Americans. It's a whole mix. Oh my gosh. So who do I talk to? What gesture do I use? What jo you know, antidote? I always go to the side of the most conservative cultural trait because then I'm going to be the safest. But that doesn't mean that I don't mix it up a little bit for learning styles. So if I know that I'm going to have a few Japanese people in the room and I want to do a class participation activity, I will make sure that everyone gets the activity ahead of time so that they can prepare so they're more likely to participate versus get up and leave the training for that hour. So it's all about preparing ahead of time knowing who's there, whether it's a gender issue, whether it is a culture issue, um, and again, being non-judgmental, being accepting, and having some fun with what you do. Thank you very, very much for the opportunity to talk to you today about some of the multicultural issues within communication and training. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.